All right, so I'm going to try something different today, and um, let's take a look at some um, subwoofer design for a larger uh, scale gig. Back in 2015, I was asked to design and work with Bass Nectar to create uh, sound system coverage and subwoofer coverage for an arena down in Birmingham, Alabama, about 19,000 capacity seated, uh, plus more capacity since they're using some of the floor. And it was an in the round gig with the bass nectar in the, in the middle on a small platform. And the goal was to create a massive amount of low end in 360 degrees and cover this arena. For the flown stuff, uh, ended up using a, an Anya rig and flying multiple clusters around the outside. Not gonna get into that too much, but that was uh, very effective. Uh, the sub coverage was especially interesting. Uh, when you have a ring of subs, the focal point of any cluster or array is going to be the equidistant point, which means that the loudest spot will be dead center of the ring. And he had done um, in the round New Year's Eve performance a year before in Nashville um, that I was not involved with. And there was issues with the low end being so loud at the uh, at his uh, at the DJ position on the mix riser on the DJ riser there that it was causing his hard drives to skip. His screens were moving so much he couldn't see them. It was blurring his vision. Um, so, how do we create a subwoofer system such that we are reaching very high levels? throughout a large space and keeping it very quiet uh, right next, pretty much right next to the subs. So I'm going to go over the um, process I went through to some degree and um, we'll take a look at some pretty pictures. All right, so we'll start with, uh, this is Sound Vision software and I was designing around an SB28, L Acoustic SB28 subwoofer as the enclosure at that time. And here we can see, I'll zoom in, uh, we can see I've got five subs set up pointing to the left here. Um, if we look at that, we can see that we have those five subs there. Turn those on, take a look at what they're doing. And um, we can see that the coverage, they project outward in front of them louder and uh, there's quite a bit of sound uh, projecting behind them. The scale that I'm using, this is 32 hertz to 63 hertz. It's pretty much just the one octave. I didn't want to look at higher frequencies too much. I can get those out of the main flown system. And the lower frequencies, this seemed to be the primary thing to look at to give me um, useful data. And then on the left here, you can see that our range is from 106 to 130, and I'm going to change that to um, 5 dB, and we're going to go to 100 to 130. So we can look out here. Now you're not going to see, I can see a pop-up when I click on these spaces that doesn't show up in the recording here, but this pop-up will tell me what the volume is. So it's saying we're 99 dB um, out here at 300 feet. This is 50 feet per square. Now, if I click here, I can see that around where the mix position is, we've got 121 dB here at um, in the center of the room. So the next thing we're going to do is take a look at adding more subs around the outside. There's one set. Let's go ahead and add um, the rest of the subwoofers in a ring which would surround the DJ booth. And we can go ahead and turn those on. And this is the, you can see the two that are on. And I'll just turn them on arbitrarily. And each block of five subs here is um, pointed outward. All right, so there's um, five times eight clusters. 40 subs pointed outward. And now what we've done is we've reached a volume level around the perimeter of the arena at 105 dB, 
which is about on the bottom end of the scale what I want to reach. That would be nice at 300 feet. But what it's showing here, when I click here, and I don't, you can't see it, but it says 133 dB uh, volume in the center. Um, that's not going to be acceptable. Uh, we're not loud enough on the outside. It would be nice to be a bit louder, but definitely we're way too loud on the inside. So let's go ahead and go to our next step here. And what I'll do is I will mute all of these. So the next thing I would do is I would set up a Enfire or cardioid um, set up in order to increase the energy delivered at a, uh, in the forward field and reduce the energy in the rear field. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm going to unmute and unhide. And what I've got here is three subs behind the five subs. I've chosen three and five because that ratio actually worked out. It took me quite a while to, or a bit of time to figure that out. But, um, and also we can see we've got a gain over here of 0.4 dB on the um, group one, which is the rear sub. So there's three subs behind, but that's um, something we'll deal with in a bit. All right, so there's our coverage now with um, two sets of subs, but we haven't added any delay. So let's go ahead and have the sound come out of the rear subs first. And the front subs will wait for that and then radiate sound. And I know that that happens to be a group two delay of about six milliseconds. And there we can see that we've got some forward projection. We've increased our volume out front and you can see that we've collapsed it in the back. Uh, let's try 6.5. And it looks not too much different. We can go ahead and look at that. I can click here and I'll tell you that it's 103 dB at the perimeter and in the center of the right in the middle there it is 119. So we've, we've improved it in the center but we haven't really helped it out outside too much. This is not going to work for us. It's still even with one cluster it's too loud. Um, we're going to need this center. So let's try, we we'll need the center part of the room to be much lower in volume. So let's try a different configuration. Instead of having the sound come out of the inside cluster and have the outside wait, let's go the opposite and set up a, which is an end fire, let's go the opposite way and set up a cardioid array. In a cardioid array, we're going to have the sound radiated from the outer cluster, the farther from the, uh, the closer to the audience first. And we're going to use the rear cluster to cancel out sound coming from the backside. Um, these uh, clusters are about seven feet from grill to grill. And so the sound will come out of here and we'll flip polarity and then have sound come out of here, out of polarity. So I'm going to do that. I will go to the group two, group one, I'm going to want out of polarity. And let's go here and click polarity reverse. I need group two to have no delay on it. So now um, they're out of polarity and there's no delay on either. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to delay this rear cluster such that it's canceling the sound, which is group one, and we're going to add a six millisecond delay to that. And now look what we've achieved, which is quite nice. We're seeing a cancellation behind and summation in front, and it's um, fairly considerable. So let's see, let's go ahead and do our measurements. Uh, that's showing 102.95, 103 dB, so about the same, slightly less. And let's go ahead and look at the volume in the center of the room. And now we're at 92 dB. So we went from 120 or whatever that was down to we've lost uh, 25 dB or more in the middle here. Uh, that's going to be a viable um, setup for this 
application. So let's go ahead and expand that out. Okay, there's our entire array set up. This, let's go ahead and look at the volume now. And here we're at 107 dB at 300 feet. And here in the middle of the room, this, when I click here, I'm seeing 106 dB. Well, shoot, we're the same volume 10 feet away from these things behind as we are 300 feet away. Uh, that's quite an accomplishment, but still not enough. Um, let's see if we can take this further. Let's see what happens if I alter the delay time. Right now we're set at six milliseconds. I'm gonna to go to 6.1 milliseconds. Now, 0.1 milliseconds is about an inch. It's, it's very, very, uh, one millisecond is about a foot. So 0.1, a tenth of a foot. And there we went from 106 dB in the middle to 98 dB. We're seeing an 8 dB drop from a 0.1 millisecond differential. That seems quite suspicious to me. How can 1.2 inches alter it that much? Um, 6.2 milliseconds. And we see a slightly different pattern. 105 dB. So that's 6.1. It really wants to be um, 6.1. I believe it's 6.11 is... Um, was what gave me the best results in this prediction. And 97 dB, we've got a significant amount of drop, 102 dB, this little fly out that you can't see, 97 dB. And then we'll zoom out and we will see here that it is coming up at 107. So we've got almost a 10 dB differential between right in the center of a ring of subs versus at the perimeter. Let's go ahead and compare back. That's actually quite amazing and very difficult to do. Um, I'm gonna head it, go ahead and mute group one, which is the inner ring of subs. And we had 107 out here. Now we're at 105. We've lost some energy because they do contribute to the outside energy and we've turned off some subs. And by muting the inner ring of subs, inner ring of subs, we are now seeing 136 dB um, in the center, um, up from 96 or 97 dB. So that's a 40 dB amount of reduction. 40 dB is, in, is an extreme amount. I'm going to go ahead and unmute that. Now, one thing that we saw that was interesting was that this changing this, even 0.1 milliseconds actually makes a change in several dB. And when we're dealing with 40 dB of drop, I mean, 10 times 10 times 10 times 10, um, you know, this is an extremely, uh, the amount of cancellation that's happening, the amount of energy being canceled out is so significant that even the slightest changes will affect it. I was skeptical with seeing that, although I did try and optimize um, going in, but I also was aware that it could be an issue that would manifest itself. So let's go ahead and take this further because it's not only the uh, time offset, but the temperature offset. If you look over here, it says that we are 30 degrees centigrade. 30 degrees is quite warm, um, or Celsius. 30 degrees is quite, quite warm. We'll drop it down to 25 degrees, which is um, you know, more in the room temp range. And look, is what, look at what has happened here in the middle. Uh, that's made a significant level change. It was in the 97 dB range, and now it's at 101. We got four, 102. 101.94. We got a 5 dB increase in the center of the room with a 5 degree decrease in temperature. Now, at warmer temperature, uh, the sound moves faster. So at slower temperatures, it'll move slower, which means we should probably need a longer delay time here to fix that. Let's try it. 
And look, we're cleaning up a little bit by going to 6.2 milliseconds. Let's try 6.3, probably too much. Yep, it is too much. Let's try um, 6.15 milliseconds. And we're in a reasonably good space with 99 dB, up from 97. So as the temperature drops, the delay time of this inner ring needs to increase. And conversely, as the temperature increases to 30, now we went from 99 to what reads now is 102. We need to, the sound speeds up, and we need to decrease our delay time in order to maintain this cancellation. Now I noticed this and I was aware of these factors going into it. The question was how much would that manifest itself in the real world? Are these micro delay, you know, milliseconds, fractions of a millisecond delay time going to be an issue in real life or can we just um, get close and be done? Uh, so what I did was I set up a microphone. Let's go ahead and move this over. Um, I set up a microphone on the DJ riser, which was up about six or eight feet here. And I monitored that to an analyzer to smart during the performance. And when he tuned the delay time for the show uh, to, for maximum cancellation on the riser there. And then as the show went on, um, I was able to monitor the level on the, the sound pressure level on the riser. And as I saw it starting to increase in volume, um, I was able to reduce the delay time um, during the performance and then proceed to cancel that back out again and um, prevent it from um, getting out of control. I had set it up. I wasn't sure I would need it. And uh, actually, in reality, I ended up needing it. The room did heat up quite a bit. This was in Birmingham, Alabama. It was hot and humid. And um, the sound level at the riser began to rise significantly um, a little ways into the show. As the room filled up, um, I decreased, decreased the delay time and was able to recancel it back out. I will show you some pictures of the actual uh, show. Uh, the first picture here. And uh, here we're looking at from above. It's, um, you can see the dual rings. You can see the, the scoreboard sitting low over the top and um, the blocks of five subs around the perimeter there and then the blocks of three subs on the inner perimeter and then the DJ riser. Now, going from doing the uh, predictive design, was not sure of the exact heights and specs of where and where um, the artist would be. Again, had to make some um, adjustments. The cancellation of these subs at the horizontal plane down on the floor level, like I was showing in the uh, sound vision software, is going to be slightly different than the cancellation up at an altitude where the riser has brought, um, where the artist was performing from. And so again, that um, was a slightly um, shorter delay time um, up at the altitude there. And using that microphone was able to tune that. I can actually do that in sound vision, um, though it doesn't show properly because the sources are below the surface. The um, uh, doesn't show on the top of the surface. So I didn't do it for this demo here. Let's go ahead and look at the next picture. Uh, there's the Anya rig that was hanging in perimeter. I believe we had six clusters hanging around, or eight clusters hanging around, large and small, large and small, and four corners. Uh, here's another shot of the subwoofers here. Uh, a little bit clearer version of that. Now, it was really interesting, and um, another one similar. Uh, here's an up close of the three and five and then the infill arcs. Now, when you would walk 
from the venue, the amount of low frequency energy out here in front of these subs was was um, quite overwhelming. And then as you walked in between the two, it became kind of disconcerting. You could hear the sound coming from the two different sources. They weren't summing um, exactly, they weren't summing well. You could tell the energy was pulling towards the outside there. And then when you walked into the middle of the riser area, you could hear the sound of rattling. You could feel that there was energy everywhere, but the sound of the low end was everywhere but where you were. You could hear the room. You could hear it coming from far away, but the actual localized subwoofer sound was um, almost non-existent or non-noticeable. Um, it was a very surreal experience to be in the center there. Okay, so that's it for today. Um, hope you find this interesting. Let me know any questions. Um, and um, let me know if you like this kind of format and I'll try and do some more. Cool, cool.